Um, and um, so it's been very nice in the last few years. Um, well, I'm now uh, a professor, uh, in, in, I'm sorry, emeritus professor in Cambridge and, and uh, London. But I've been working with the Malaysian Commonwealth Studies Centre, which has been generously funded uh, to enable us to do projects uh, in uh, Malaysia and Asia. Uh, and, um, and I'll tell you something about, about that as, as we go along. Um, and um, there are very interesting ways in which we're now collaborating on projects between Malaysia and, and, um, and the UK and other countries. Now, the aim of this, of this uh, talk uh, is uh, well, for me to talk and then for us to have some discussion, which I look forward to. Uh, and uh, we're, we're talking about the follow-up of this uh, famous meeting that took place in December in Paris, uh, the uh, Conference of the Parties, number 21, following the original one in, in uh, Rio in 1992. Uh, and we're going to particularly look at strategic investment in science and technology. Now, uh, that we had a meeting about this in London uh, two weeks ago, and uh, a man called uh, Jeremy Leggett, uh, who was a lecturer at Imperial College, and he worked with John Horton on the early um, moves towards climate change. And he then subsequently became was very successful setting up a company called Solar Century. And he's a bit of a journalist and a writer. And he began this meeting in London, so I thought I'd share it with you. So perhaps the meeting in COP21 was the most important meeting in the history of the world. So there's a, a, a thought that you might think about. And then I was thinking perhaps, this is a slightly biased, the previous important meeting was when Adam met Eve, maybe, if, you're, if, you're, uh, uh, if you're of that particular religious persuasion. Uh, if you, I don't know where, where the equivalent uh, happens if in other kinds of Anyway, so that, that's, uh, that's a, a, a thought you might like to... Uh, it, it clearly was a very, very important uh, uh, event. Uh, and uh, uh, in, in a way, it's a sort of existential um, time we are in, in which if we make the right decisions, we will be able to control the, 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 the growth of um, increase in temperature and the consequences. Um, and if we don't, uh, then there will be progressive problems for the whole world. So I would like to just make a sort of a greeting from Cambridge University uh, and the city of Cambridge. Um, and um, I say I'm a, I'm a politician. I used to be a, on the Cambridge City Council as leader of the Labour Party. Um, and Cambridge is now famous for, uh, um, for very large numbers of Chinese visiting here. There's a famous Chinese poet who made a famous poem called Goodbye Cambridge. Uh, and uh, so we now have thousands and thousands of people. They all come to, to this area of Cambridge near, near um, I think it's a thing, yeah. This is King's College. Uh, and there's a sort of a stone uh, <coughs> memorial there. And a uh, famous scientist called Lewis Richardson, my great uncle. He was a professor there. And he's, he really invented the numerical methods that we use for weather forecasting today. So I've already mentioned. So I'm just going to comment that um, I helped set up in Cambridge with colleagues a company which now sits above the copper kettle on King's Parade. There are 27 people there working on these climates uh, and other <laughs> problems. Now, uh, one way of trying to think in a, in a sort of quick way about the issues of climate change is to take a sort of di schematic diagram. So you can either read three volumes of the IPCC or you can look at one diagram and you'll get this, uh, not quite the same answer, but uh, something of the same idea. So the, the, the issue really is the following, is that uh, we are burning uh, forests, we are heating buildings, we have got transportation, and uh, this leads to carbon dioxide in this region between the ground and about uh, 10 kilometers uh, up. And um, this is what's called the tropopause. Um, and it was uh, suggested by the, the Swedish uh, scientist, chemist, Arrhenius, in the 1880s, that in fact, because uh, we are accumulating more and more carbon dioxide as a result of human activities, then uh, the temperature would start rising in this region. And uh, Arrhenius in 1880 said the temperature might rise to five degrees Celsius. And now the current projection is that it might rise to four degrees in 2100. So it wasn't a bad calculation uh, based upon sort of 
back of envelope calculations in Sweden, Sweden at that time. The consequence of trapping this so-called long-wave radiation is that it gets getting cooler uh, in, the, in the regions of here. So we're having a kind of uh, a changes to the atmosphere of this region. Now, as we're of getting warmer, we now know that many of our mountains are losing ice and snow. We are having floods and landslides. We are having, in some cases, faster winds. Uh, we're having great convection in the atmosphere. Um, and the patterns of motion that are changing. Um, just to give you a simple example, um, the British uh, uh, Met Office gives weather forecasts. If you've been to Britain, you know everybody looks at the weather forecast. It's a very important part of our life. Um, and um, <clears throat> when I was head of the Met Office, I noticed, and I went to America, I noticed in America they keep talking about the jet stream. And I came back to England and I said, why didn't we talk about the jet stream? Oh, we never talk about the jet stream. That was 1992. Now we talk about the jet stream all the time. Um, and uh, it's very interesting because the jet stream it is a, it's a river of air in the atmosphere which divides sort of cooler air to the north uh, and warmer air to the south. And every school child in America knows that this is how they, they think about the weather. And so I said, why don't we have that in England? They said, well, it comes to Britain, it all breaks up, it's all chaotic. We just have weather fronts, you know. Uh, and so the interesting point is that, in fact, we now do get a, more, a rather more sort of a continuous um, division, so this notion. And the point about large blocking events is that we often then have very static conditions uh, which can lead to either very cold weather or very warm weather, and that's an important difference. So the point about climate change is it's not just a simple get, getting warmer or getting colder. It's a, it's a, it's a patterns of patterns of change. And, uh, Now, the, uh, um, the, the reason well, this is just to show you the real numbers, um, that uh, uh, over this period uh, from the way, way back then to now, the, the, the concentrations have been steadily rising. They, they oscillate a bit as they rise because of the absorption in the oceans and the forests. Um, and the question is, um, how, how much will that increase? And this is essentially due to human influence. There's no other explanation for this effect. And even the skeptics are always saying, well, actually, climate change, they don't believe it. They haven't got an answer to explain this. Um, and of course, the other point about carbon dioxide is that it uh, then it dissolves in water. And so the uh, waters of the ocean are becoming more acid. And one of the, of course, important features of the tropical regions is that you have um, coral, coral reefs and the extraordinary um, beauty of those, the importance of those. Coral reefs are very important, of course, also for preventing the tsunamis reaching coastlines. The breakdown of, of coral reefs is an important other feature. Um, the interesting point then is that, and I'm not going to give you a lecture about how you, how you do modeling or calculations, but essentially the point about is that, is that Richardson's uh, idea in 1920 was that all these complicated processes here could be uh, calculated by dividing this up into sort of square boxes or cubes. Um, his calculations were completely wrong. Um, and in those days, you could publish a paper which was completely wrong, and you tell the readers this is completely wrong, but it's an interesting idea. Nowadays, unless you fiddle the answer so it agrees with the calculation, nobody will publish it, you know. But, uh, and uh, so honesty, honesty wins out. Um, and uh, so that was, that was the, the, the methodology uh, of Richardson. Uh, so these, these calculations uh, are such now that we can actually look at the difference between what would happen to the temperature over time if we didn't have climate change or uh, forcing by carbon dioxide. So this is the blue lines here. But if you allow for the fact that we are releasing more carbon dioxide due to burning uh, uh, fuel, particularly fossil fuel, you see this rising temperature. Uh, and essentially, the calculations and the observations are approximately in line. Now, uh, I was head of the Met Office in 1992, 97. And in that year, um, the calculations were going, once again, completely wrong. Uh, it was very very striking that the that the calculations were all shooting up much 
much more. So these are, as it were, the latest calculations. Um, so what was wrong? Um, and uh, what was wrong was that um, there was a lot of aerosols in the atmosphere from, from pollution. And the aerosols, as it were, trap the uh, air, uh, tra trap the, the, the radiation, and therefore it was getting, 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 uh, getting warmer. Uh, sorry, I apologize. Because of, because of, the, because of the, 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 the aerosols, the temperature was not rising as much and because the, sun, the sun's rays were not coming down so fast. So particularly in Asia, um, the aerosols here have a very big effect on the temperature. If, if the air here was completely clear, as they've often been calculated in China, the temperature would be rising faster. So actually pollution has actually helped the rising of temperature. So one of the features about dealing with climate change is you've got to not deal with the air, air pollution as well as the carbon emissions. Um, now, during the, 19, uh, during the last decade, um, there, uh, this has been seen, been seen that the, this is the graph shown by the uh, International Panel. You've been seeing this steady rising of the temperature. Now, uh, from the year 2000 onwards, uh, during the last decade, the temperature was not rising very much. This was called the pause. Uh, and uh, many, um, many politicians uh, said, well, actually, this shows that climate change is going to stop. We don't need to worry. Um, and I'm not joking, but this was the argument produced by the Republican Party in the United States in the famous debate for the Mar what was called the Markey Waxman uh, legislation. And that was brought to the, to the, to the uh, uh, House and Senate uh, and Congress. And the, the politicians there said, and I've been told by them, that in fact, the, um, because the temperature was rising, and this is the time scale of a politician, they said, why should we do anything about climate change? <coughs> However, at the same time, the temperature was rising over the land areas, uh, and just showing you that there was, this was a more complicated variation. Um, and in fact, at the same time, other countries like Europe uh, and, and the UK were introducing legislation which actually said that we should be starting to reduce emissions because this upward trend is very dangerous. Um, well, I've said that in words. I'm going to do that now. now, what has been happening in the, in the history of, 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 of the agreements? Well, the first, sorry. The meeting took place in, in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. And that was a very important uh, a meeting in which uh, there was not only a, an agreement to form a, an international body to, um, plan, to do the science and plan the reduction of emissions, but it was also a, a meeting where we looked at the, it was important to maintain the biodiversity of all the, the natural world, and it was also important to consider uh, and reduce desertification. Now, uh, so this was just as it were a statement of intent and the important feature went on in Kyoto two years later, when 55 countries, the richer countries, said they would start reducing emissions. But the countries that were so-called develop, developing countries did not, at that time, have to make any, any obligation. They had no obligation. Um, so that was a very important difference. And because China and India and other big emitting countries did not have to sign the um, Kyoto Protocol, many politicians, including those in the United States and some in, in, in Europe, said, well, why should we actually be reducing emissions if big countries like India and China are not doing so? So that was the kind of uh, issue that was rumbling along in the last 10, 20 years. In Copenhagen in 2009, when the heads of government converged, um, they again said some countries would reduce emissions. Uh, some countries said they would in then and then stop doing so, like, uh, like Australia and Canada. So there's been a continuing uh, um, uh, debate. So there was no agreement to formally extend Kyoto at that time. But if we now go on to, to where we are now, essentially the Paris meeting, which had, took place in December, was really a follow-on from a very important commitment made in Durban four years before, uh, which is I and uh, other politicians were visiting South Africa at that time. And what they said in Durban was that both the developed and developing countries, they would, by 2015, actually start reporting on emissions. They would actually uh, start uh, 
having targets, and these targets would actually start being monitored by 2020. So essentially, Durban was a very important, they thought, a platform that was then made definite by the meeting in Paris. At the meeting in Paris, the science uh, began to be, be very clear that uh, climate change is implied extremes. CO2 was, was rising up to 2050. Temperature rise could well be very significant. Um, but now, uh, the other feature following this was that a number of countries have been developing internal legislation uh, influenced by international agreements. I mean, the China, for example, had its own internal legislation, which they said was affected by this. If I now just go to the next stage. So the main conclusion of Paris then, just to repeat this point, now, the science agreement was that it was uh, agreed on climate change trends and that there was a, 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 an increase in extremes. And this could rise to four degrees by 2100 if we continue business as usual. There is some considerable uncertainty about changes in the variability of climate. Some areas may be getting much warmer than others. The rain may be increasing in some areas, not in others. And so in other words, there is an uncertainty about these variations that are very important to consider. And I mentioned polar water blocking uh, as one example. Um, so if you look at the graphs uh, in a bit more detail, you see that the temperature change is wobbling around so, uh, for, for these various factors. But what's really important is that the temperature will really change very differently depending upon what assumptions you make about the emissions. So if you, as it were, in a, in a benign way, start reducing emissions here, the temperature will reach two degrees and then will start declining. If we do nothing, we carry on as before, it will reach uh, uh, four degrees or so. Um, you then may say, well, uh, I've already told you that uh, L.F. Richardson published his results and they were wrong, um, but they had the right idea. If you look here now, you see this is the kind of range of calculations of different computer models. Uh, and obviously, there is quite a range. But the, in the central region here, you can see there's a good deal of agreement uh, between. And that's the basis for policy. Um, one of the other features, I've, well, this is a rather complicated graph, but it, what it shows is that uh, one, of the, one of the really worrying features about the, 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 the pattern I have to tell you a joke at this point. There was a famous golfer called Bob, famous politician, famous not politician, actor, film actor, called Bob Hope. And Bob Hope said, if you came to England and you played golf, by the time you did a stroke up and down, the weather would have changed. Uh, and uh, so, so obviously that was the pattern. So the idea now that the weather might be the same for, um, for 20 days, uh, this sort of blocking process is very worrying for farmers, transportation, and so on. So these are the kind of effects that we have to have to consider. Um, uh, one of the features about the, uh, the of course, about the uh, warming in higher latitudes is that we are seeing the area of ice steadily reducing, and the fact that, uh, of course, that there may be no ice for polar bears is something that everybody can understand. And but the, but the idea is that uh, we may well find that by midsummer uh, there will be no ice. Now, this has very important politics. You might think, what has the polar ice got to do with Singapore? Well, I was sitting on a committee in London uh, this year about the Arctic, future of the Arctic, as we saw it. And one of the important points was that um, we would expect to see here but here's Greenland and so on, and here's uh, Alaska, um, that progressively the ships leaving Rotterdam would come around this, this northern, this northern uh, uh, route. Um, and so Singapore has now joined the Arctic Council uh, uh, and taking a great interest in what happens. In fact, the, the Singaporeans, being what they are, they, are what, they attend every meeting, unlike the British, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and they are uh, going to be the... Uh, dominant force in the Arctic before you know where you are. Yeah. Uh, I have to say, of course, that the Prime Minister of Singapore was at Trinity College. Uh, he was one of my tutorial pupils. So uh, I, I have a high respect for decisions made in Singapore, um, as well as Malaysia. Uh, so um, so the, the, the next thing then is we go on to policy objectives. Um, the technology targets 
after reduced emissions so the temperature rises less than 2 degrees C and preferably 1.5. The, and the, the consequences of these are very important. They, this should be able to reduce impacts of hazards uh, and things such as uh, air and water pollution. Um, but this requires, I mean, so for example, this should lead to reduction of the sea level rise. I mean, it is very remarkable to meet politicians from the islands in the Pacific, in which periodically the entire island is covered with water. I mean, it is absolutely, uh, you know, remarkable. The Speaker of the House of uh, uh, Assembly of Melanesia, you know, is, is speaks very warmly about this, this issue. Um, uh, so, the, ultimately, we've got to reduce our carbon emissions to near zero, and this requires, of course, new concepts of zero or reduced carbon vehicles, ships, houses, agriculture, forestry, combined and many combined methodologies. Just to remind you, ships, many people think it's aeroplanes are the problem. Ships are producing three times more than, uh, than aeroplanes. Um, and in fact, ship shipping could reduce its emissions just by going more slowly. The speed that ships go has quite a significant impact on its emissions. So if, for example, they went half the speed, uh, you would actually reduce uh, the emissions by about 7%, 7 really quite a large amount. Now, the way in which this has got to work it has, well, it has in an international agreed way is by national planning. Um, and the idea is that the countries will have their plans and they will report on them every five to ten years. That was agreed in Paris. Um, and the um, documents that do governments are to produce is something called the Intended Nationally Determined Contribution. And I've been uh, shown by Professor Ferreira the Malaysian one. It's a very complicated document showing all the different ways in which this country will reduce its emissions. Um, some countries, uh, as it were, essentially have legislation, as they do in Britain, so every year the parliament looks at it. I think that in Malaysia this is a more a, a kind of governmental department uh, operation, but the uh, parliamentarians should surely be involved. So the British uh, parliament has this, has this um, legislation that we should reduce our uh, emissions by 80% by 2050. So every year, then five years, we have these strategic discussions. Um, and one of the, well, I, I just put this slide up because it, this is a slide produced by, in fact, by the insurance industry in the UK, um, showing you the extraordinary patterns of natural hazards we have, particularly in this part of the world. Uh, and uh, Malaysia it has its, its exposure, but uh, so, so the Indonesia and Philippines particularly strongly, um, where we have these patterns of, uh, of hurricanes moving, huge storms, earthquakes in this area. And one of the biggest problems to me is that can we, can we make predictions of earthquakes? Um, and curiously, th there is some very interesting science using satellite data that may enable us to do that. And of course, there are quite different patterns here where you don't, don't have cyclones. And, um, um, my, my, my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Johnny Chan, who works on this network, uh, Hanks, he uh, who's based in Hong Kong, he was one of the people who it enabled us now to forecast much more accurately these, uh, these uh, hazards, hurricanes. So one of the ways, you may not be able to stop these some of the hazards, but you will be able to forecast them much better than before. Um, so one of the questions then about, the, about the, uh, how will we actually do this um, kind of reduction of emissions. And there was a report produced by the British government, the Stern Report, and their idea was either we should start reducing now, or what we're going to do is to keep uh, carry on, uh, carry on uh, increasing, and then we're going to have a shock approach. Um, it's a very interesting question, and you may be in our debates uh, now, we should have a discussion. Are we going to be sensible, or are we going to be unwise? Or, of course, the unwisest of all is to ca carry on doing this. But let's assume that the, the consequences will become so serious, and then we'll have a shock approach, which is certainly not the best way for an economy or societies to adjust to complex uh, situations. Um, uh, and one of the other features, of course, is lifestyle changes hugely, and this is the energy reduced by people. So if you live in Houston, people drive 30 miles for a, to go to a delicatessen or something. Uh, 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 and uh, whereas in Moscow or 
or, or Tokyo, they use very much less energy per person through their own sort of lifestyle. So, so these are very important decisions and the object of politicians, of course, and governments and societies and it is to keep moving us down this graph of, of uh, energy use. And uh, some countries, if we don't start cutting with our emissions, we have problems like they do have in China, a combination of energy release and huge um, pollution problems. Uh, and some cities, of course, are changing dramatically. Um, and uh, this is the situation that is seen now in, in, uh, in Hong Kong. As you saw, this is Hong Kong in 1952. This is Hong Kong in 2007. The har harbor has been reducing. The city uh, houses are higher. Uh, and we're having a lot of emission of energy. So the result is the temperature is rising much greater. So, so it's not just that we've got to think about the rising temperature over the globe, which is the orange curve. We've got to think about the fact that in the cities, it's rising even more, much more. Uh, and, um, and the result of that is that, of course, people are then using energy for air conditioning. Um, and of course, in some cases, you're having significant mortality. In Paris in 2003, people were dying, 20,000 people died in France. So, so this is a, a double effect that we have to consider. And the, and the, uh, and, and the treaty in Paris, of course, will, will, will not prevent cities doing that, but it will be a background upon which decisions need to be taken. Um, and the rainfall is a, the rainfall is another very extraordinary feature, which we've seen uh, uh, that. So this is Hong Kong's uh, uh, rainfall. And um, so now we have rainfall in Hong Kong more than 200 millimeters in, a, in, that's in three hours, or more than uh, 100 millimeters per hour, and it's rising. And the frequency is, is increasing much more. And again, we can see some of this is due to the cities, partly due to, to global climate change. Um, now, this is a meeting partly of international financial relations. Um, so well, the first big question uh, of it's been rumbling along and, and was discussed in Paris was um, should there be uh, first of all uh, international uh, uh, acknowledgement that the emissions of carbon by countries like the UK from, from, from the last 200 years uh, should it has been changing the global temperature which is therefore leading to effects in developing countries for example damage caused by human climate change, sea level rise, drought, deforestation, high temperature. Should the, the richer countries that created this compensate the developing countries? Essentially, that has happened. There is a, a commitment to, to producing funding of the order of $100 billion. The other feature, of course, is collaboration or competition between countries or groups of countries to share information. Um, now, one of the remarkable features at uh, the Paris meeting was the uh, as it were, arrangements for much more information to flow to countries for their technology, for example, for uh, uh, solar, solar collectors. Uh, and I think the sharing of technology between countries is really going to be very important, and ASEAN should play a big role in this, in this part of the world. The other feature, of course, is that people should be able to learn more, the use of the web, Facebook, and the Italian cucumber that we make use of enables people to know much more what's going on. And that's one of the ways in which governments, I believe, will be able to, get, to implement their policies. And, and, uh, and this will be the basis of which businesses do their work. Um, and this is an example uh, of the use of technology um, for a most uh, serious situation in Southeast Asia, which is the uh, extraordinary floods that take place in Manila. So this is a, a, a picture. Uh, superimposed on a satellite picture of Manila, and you see these red areas are where people are finding that the, red, that the floods are up to their shoulders. The, the, the yellow ones are up to the middle and, they, and, the, uh, and so on. So this information is now being monitored by people having, having uh, sort of cell, cell phones. This information goes to a central computing point, and then they make a forecast uh, for the next hour and day, for how the rain, is, the floods are going to go, and this has led to the reduction of vast thousands of lives. So we're going to be having these hazards, so we've got to find methods of reducing the impact on hazards. But the best thing of all, of course, would be to reduce 
the overall temperature rise that gives rise to these effects. Um, well, I think I'm, I'm just, this is the carbon crunch. Are we going to carry on digging coal as they, as they are, or are we going to stop that and start finding uh, as it were, low carbon solutions? Um, at the ocean. Now, I was just going to finish my talk uh, um, by commenting that one of the questions is whether we're going to find some almost magic solution. Um, well, this is a well established method of using windmills, and that's growing. And, uh, windmills and solar PV are now about 20% or 25%, even 30% in some countries. Um, of course, in Denmark, everybody thinks Denmark has um, marvelously clean uh, environment uh, carbon, but uh, Denmark actually um, produces more carbon per person than Britain. Now, why do you think that is? I'm afraid it, it, it's because the Danish have a lot of pigs. And, uh, and <laughs> so it depends on your, your diet also makes a big difference. Uh, uh, and uh, so, uh, that, so that's one sort of piece of takeaway fact for you. Um, uh, uh, and the, the, the other important point, of course, is that, is that the idea was around in, in the 70s, I worked on this and others, uh, that we, sh we would be able to make gases fusion in, 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 a, in a big magnet. We, the temperatures will become very high, and you would then have a completely clean a method. The only thing that you're running out of would be, would be sea water, which is not going to run out very fast. So this is fusion, and it may be that you can combine this with fission so as to clean up all our terrible nuclear waste. Um, and uh, so uh, there was a European or an international project called the DEMO, or the ETA. Um, uh, and uh, it may be that this is actually too big and too clumsy, and so there's a private sector alternative, which I help advise, about having modular systems. So we may well have, I believe, this may well be a very important development if the changes are remarkable. And the fact that now the private sector is investing very heavily in this area uh, is, I think, quite uh, significant. Um, and here is, uh, can you imagine, so this is, agreements move slowly in the subject. Um, and um, so here is uh, Mr. Gorbachev and Mr. Reagan, a long time ago. Uh, they made this agreement uh, in the 80s, and we're just about beginning to see some of the results in the preliminary uh, studies, uh, experiments at the present time. And uh, what I wanted to say was that uh, here in, uh, Malaysia, Hong Kong, India, uh, other countries of Asia, we set up this uh, network, Asian network of climate science and technology, which works with other networks, and we're trying to develop a, a coordination of Asian researchers. One of the important points, which we have not succeeded yet, it's always important to tell you things we didn't succeed in, is trying to tell the world that the weather in the tropics is different to the weather at higher latitudes. It, uh, it, it, it sounds, that sounds a bit, uh, a bit naive, but all the computer models, such as the one starting with Richardson, are all based upon experiments done in Salisbury Plain and Kansas and outside Moscow. Um, and therefore, they don't work very well in the tropics. And yet, this is where most people live, um, and it's very important. Um, so one of the things we do is we do these studies and we publish our studies in Asian journals. A lot of Asians never publish in Asian journals. They always publish in funny journals like Nature. I mean, why would you want to do that? Uh, and uh, so, so it's really important, you know, to, to focus on. Now, there's a nice story about this because when the Dutch first came here, it's only a little historian, in the 17th century, they noticed things a bit, bit funny with this weather that we're seeing. And they noticed that um, often there was no wind at the ground in their sailing ships. High up there was a wind. Now, you probably know in, in Asia, in the evenings that the wind stops, boys and sometimes girls fly kites, you know, even though there's no wind at the ground, which is very strange, you know, to observe this. Because the fact is, the wind is blowing above. So the Dutch called this area the land beneath the wind. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> <laughs> and so. So that's an example, you know, of thinking and understanding that, uh, and so one of the things that we try to do is that. Uh, I think I should stop there. Thank you very much indeed.